Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Malta School of Art for the second public event of the 12th edition of the Malta Mediterranean Literature Festival. Apart from being the interviewer tonight, Antoine Cassar is also the coordinator of tonight's event, Literature as Public Space, and one of the key team members of this festival, together with Nadia Mifsud, who will be interpreting from French to English. Our speakers tonight are three of this edition's guest authors, Lilia Ben-Ramdan from Tunisia, Zoe Scolding from Wales, and Gyoko Zdraveski from the Republic of Macedonia. It is an honor to have you here with us. Thank you, and enjoy it. Thank you, Justine. So a warm welcome, a very warm welcome. I'm, <laughs> it's very hot. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, thanks to the Malta School of Art for uh, the hospitality. And thanks especially uh, to three of our festival authors for their company and for their time. Um, we're going to be speaking about poetry as a public space, but also as a private space and uh, what happens in between the public and the private. Um, this uh, interview dis stroke discussion it will be split in four parts. Uh, I'm going to start with some general questions for all three of them, and then each of them um, will recite one or two poems in the original. We'll hear also the uh, versions in English. Uh, and then I will ask them more specific questions about their poems uh, relating to the first, um, the discussion of the first part about uh, poetry as something public or private. So W. H. Auden, in an elegy that he wrote to Yeats, famously wrote that poetry makes nothing happen. Jean Portant, uh, in an article that was published today in Vida magazine, uh, said, or at least the headline said, writing can change the world. Can writing change the world? Is, um, is it true that uh, poetry can, can make a difference? Once poetry is thrown into the public space, does it, uh, can it plant seeds? Or is it just a delusion to think that poetry really makes a difference? I mean, there are some examples in uh, the history of modern and contemporary poetry where uh, poetry did, if not make a difference, at least uh, it, it was an important part of the s social um, uh, history and goings on. Uh, when Pablo Neruda died in 1973, uh, his funeral in uh, the large very large cemetery of uh, Santiago de Chile. It's almost as big as a, as a city. His funeral turned into um, a silent but very loaded procession of uh, protest against uh, the military coup um, backed by uh, the CIA in, in favor of Augusto Pinochet. A little bit later in China, um, during the protests in Tiananmen Square, um, there was a poem by Bei Dao called Answer, which was adopted as an anthem of the pro-democracy movement. In fact, it was used in two different protests in Tiananmen Square, um, seven or eight years, um, seven or eight years difference. And more recently, in Tahrir Square in Egypt, Demonstrators photocopied and distributed a poem by Tamim al Barghouti, who was here for our festival uh, in uh, 2014, I think, and who incidentally will be with us again this weekend, accompanying his father, Murid. So um, during the protests in Tahrir Square, um, Tamim's uh, poem was distributed, and two makeshift screens. Uh, were installed allowing Tamim to participate in the revo revolution by reading his verses to the crowds. So those are three examples where poetry was uh, a part of a large social protest movement. There could be examples that say that yes, poetry does make something happen, but 
today, or at least this is my, uh, the situation the, that I'm in, I, I am finding it more and more difficult to believe uh, that, uh, that poetry is an agent of political and social change. Maybe because we're going through quite pessimistic times, or at least in, the, in what we could call the Anglosphere and in, and in parts of Europe. So my first question, as a very general one is, and I will ask Lydia first, um, does poetry make anything happen? <laughs> In your opinion. Justement, justement la question est, est de définir c'est quoi la, la poésie et, et moi je, je vois il y a, en fait il y a ceux qui disent que c'est juste une représentation ou bien un agent qui pousse à l'action ou bien c'est un champ de l'âme de l'âme, pardon et moi, et moi je vois que en fait qu'on ne peut pas définir la poésie et, et je vois que qu'on peut donner sens à la poésie à travers ce qu'elle provoque ou elle produit donc, euh, peut-être on peut parler d'un poème, qu'est-ce qu'il qu qu provoque, est-ce qu'il est vraiment, est-ce qu'il pousse à l'action, est-ce qu'il représente quelque chose. On peut parler euh, d'un poète, sa ligne est directrice, comment il voit, comment il se situe par, ce, par son contexte, dans son contexte, mais on ne peut pas parler de la poésie en général si vraiment elle provoque quelque chose ou non. So Lilia is saying, I think the real question here is um, what is poetry? And she says, uh, I don't really believe there is um, one definition of poetry. Uh, it is difficult to define what poetry is or whether poetry can be an agent um, for, of change. Um, she says it would be better to ask oneself what is it that um, poetry provokes? What meaning comes out of what poetry provokes? Um, so she says, um, you can speak about a poem, you can speak about a poet, you can try to define uh, what it is that um, urges a poet to write what he or she writes. Um, but you can't really define poetry in one general sense. I see. Okay, so it's a particular poem or a particular poet maybe can uh, bring about some form of change, but not poetry in general as something difficult to define and uh, um, delimitate. Um, Zoe, what's your reaction and, or what's your opinion about the... Uh, the social role of poetry, if it has one. Yeah, well, I very much agree with... Um, is this working okay? Yeah, volume okay, great. Um, I very much agree with uh, what Lilia has said, this idea that we're not talking about a, a general mass of something called um, poetry. And um, maybe I'd go a little further with this idea that she's raised of a, a situation that the, the poem provokes, because... Um, I, I think um, that that idea that it, it's a conversation, that it, uh, it is happening um, between people, um, I, I think that takes us a little closer to the, to the question about um, you know, what happens in the um, thinking and reading and um, possible action um, around, um, around a poem. Um, so, I mean, in a way, it's um, it's a it's a it's a slightly un, it's a good question to ask in this discussion, but it's an it's an unfair question to ask of poetry, perhaps, 
um, because I mean there are other activities that are also you know very important to um, social and political change or transformation. You know that we we don't ask this question of like breathing or talking or thinking. Um, you know we're not putting those under the, quite the same pressure, but they you know they might all be um, part part of um, you know what's necessary for a, a situation to be. Um, to be transformed. So, um, certainly, I in my own writing. I mean, I'm, I'm not interested in thinking of the poem as a kind of instrumental um, um, means of changing somebody's mind about something. And, and um, you know, I certainly you know, wouldn't see the poem in that way. But what Lilia has said. It actually it opens up something much more complicated. You make something, and you you just by virtue of the fact that you're using language, you're putting it into a public space, and then you see what will will happen around it. And um, and I think I mean this might also this is a really interesting question for for thinking about what happens when we read poetry, but also after. Um, your very fascinating introduction there. I was thinking about um, situations where you know, writing poetry has been important. For example, Ernesto Cardinal in Nicaragua, where actually um, you know, creative writing workshops were part of um, a whole sort of movement towards um, certain kinds of political consciousness and action. Yoko, what do you think? Um, for me, it's interesting that uh, although I don't consider myself as a poet who writes engaged poetry, I have written only a few poems that are openly engaged and uh, are trying to do something active towards society or politics or political situation. I usually write um, about my inner world and what's happening inside of me. I think that uh, whatever you write, it's impossible to not leave a mark or uh, to not leave at least a, a, a subtle change in the outside world. So, um, poetry, it doesn't have to be actively engaged to make changes. And I think that, um, in my opinion, as a reader, I like more to read, to find out myself if there is something that can change me, or the world, or society, or whatever than something that is directly and openly engaged and, um, um, I don't know, um, sometimes uh, I feel frustrated when I see people doing that too much and too often. But, for example, we can discuss also about performing poetry, which is part of the poetry writing, is one thing, and performing in public space. Yes. It's something different. That will be another question, in fact. Um, the, um, the journey from the uh, private to the public. But let's continue talking about the public first. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about social media and poetry on social media. Um, the internet is, I mean, it's something that we used to call virtual. And yet, a lot of um, discussion, like real discussion, at least here in Malta, in another small country like Luxembourg, maybe less so in bigger countries, from what I've experienced, um, social media, particularly Facebook, is where a lot of uh, discussion actually takes place, more than in the street. It's my impression. Or at least maybe people uh, feel less, feel more unfettered. Um, and poetry has uh, a huge presence on uh, 
on the internet, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram especially. But I've been wondering um, what are the advantages but also the disadvantages of uh, publishing poetry on social media. Does uh, social media dilute the quality of poetry? Um, does it make the private public too quickly? I'm going to ask Zoe to uh, answer first. Um, I think it's a very, very interesting question. And um, so it's, yeah, coming from Wales, uh, you know, it, it, also that sense of you know, perhaps um, being at, at a distance from other things happening in the world is, is something that I've thought about a lot. And um, certainly, say 15 years ago, I think that email lists really did something in um, the, the poetry circles that I was involved in. Um, and, um, and, and that, you know, that was a very, very kind of interesting moment. And what's happened with social media is um, perhaps less of a, a kind of gathering of um, like-minded um, thinkers and, and poets, but a sort of fragmentation. And I think maybe there are more accidental connections but I, I think also you always have to ask about the kind of the machine that's actually m making us see one person's posts and and not another or you know the, the, the different ways in which you might be aware of things um, via social media it's not a it's it's not a neutral um, environment so I think it's really it's really great for hearing about events and um, it means you can organize things much more easily at the last minute and um, it's, it's uh, helpful to people who are you know, perhaps more spontaneous in, uh, in organizing things. But I, I, I don't think it really um, replaces sort of live embodied interaction or I think it works best alongside that. And um, yeah, that's... That's my feeling. So I think it certainly has made things possible, but I still think about it circumspectly, I suppose. Um, Gyoko, has social media had any particular positive or negative effects on contemporary Macedonian poetry, or even your own? Yeah, Macedonian society is also, Macedonia is a small country, two million people. So uh, whatever happened on Facebook, it was if, if it's important, everybody can see it if they want to see it. Um, I publish everything first on Facebook. I mean, I, I publish immediately when I'm fin when I'm finished with the poem. I just put it online. I'm lying to myself, maybe, but I, I, I like to say to myself that I'm doing that because I'm releasing myself and I'm releasing the poem of um, my, it's not my property, so I'm just, it's finished and I'm, it's not part of me in a way that it would be if, if I keep it with myself. Because, uh, and the other thing is that I cannot approach to the public, to the auditorium, the same way by publishing book and by posting on a social media because i um, for example my i'm 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 buying my own books and giving to people as a gift as a present and uh, the we, we publish i don't know how I, I think it it's everywhere the same like poetry is published in from 100 to 500, uh, or, even or even less. Even less so uh, it's easier to approach the public uh, by across the through the social media. And I, I, I mentioned this issue on the previous conversation. We have 
uh, in Macedonia, we have a very, very famous Facebook poet. They call him like that. They call him a Facebook poet. And he was near to become uh, one, the president of the uh, committee that organizes the biggest Macedonian national uh, poetry festival, Struga Poetry Evenings. And that decision of the Ministry of Culture made a huge chaos in uh, Facebook society in Macedonia, and that lasted for a few days, and then the guy resigned. He said, I, I'm not the guy who should do this, I'm, because th those um, things are different. If it's different if you, you don't have to write poetry to organize poetry festival, for example. Um, Lydia, do you use uh, social media for your poetry? And what's your opinion of um, the effects, positive or negative, of, so of social media on poetry? Oui, également, j'utilise euh, surtout le Facebook. Et, euh, et en fait, après la révolution tunisienne et en 2012, il y avait une émergence de plusieurs mouvements artistiques et culturels. Et, euh, et justement, Facebook a joué un rôle énorme car en se connectant sur l'espace le, virtuel, on a pu se rencontrer dans l'espace public et réel et aussi virtuel et public et donc réel et public et donc euh, le passage était nécessaire par, par l'outil par euh, les social media les réseaux sociaux et donc il suffisait de, de, de lancer l'événement sur Facebook euh, tu as des milliers de personnes dans l'espace public et donc euh, moi je, je vois que, que c'était un, un outil euh, fort de, de, de partager aussi, de partager avec l'autre, parce que le fait de, de mettre un, un texte sur Facebook, tu, également, tu le partages avec plusieurs personnes, sans, sans limite, sans contrainte, et, euh, et, et bien évidemment, il y a des inconvénients. On peut massacrer ton texte, on peut le changer, on peut euh, prendre des bouts, on peut euh, euh, enlever le nom. Mais moi, je suis quand même pour le partage, même avec cette forme-là. Et je crois qu'il qu est très grand, qu peut, euh, que tout le monde peut utiliser Facebook et partager. Et, euh, je suis plutôt pour ce, ce mouvement, cette dynamique d'échange et de partage. So Lilia is saying that, yes, she does use uh, Facebook uh, to publish her writings, her poems. Uh, she says that after the revolution in 2012, there was a um, um, lot of um, artistic movements that um, emerged and that Facebook played a huge role in this uh, because it was a place, it, it triggered a kind of um, encounter. It, it worked as a bridge, actually, uh, between people who met in this virtual space. But then, uh, if you posted an event on Facebook, then it meant that people would actually meet in the public space. So Facebook was like a bridge between these two forms, uh, between these two spaces. Um, so she believes that Facebook is a tool and a strong one for that. And um, what she really appreciates about um, social media is this idea of sharing, sharing with others. Um, so you share your texts. Um, but she says there are also, um, uh, it also has its, uh, its disadvantages. Um, so, for example, she says if you publish a text on Facebook, then someone might decide to either change it or um, she uses the word massacre, which means actually destroy it completely. Um, so it can be a threat because there's, there's nothing much that can protect you. Um, however, she is still in favor 
of this idea of sharing um, on this spiritual space. So from, from the public to the private and back, uh, I'm going to ask you first, uh, Gyoko. Um, when you're writing, in the process of writing a poem, um, you are channeling your words into some kind of imaginary space. Eh? Um, and is this imaginary space occupied by an ideal reader, as maybe Italo Calvino describes in his novel, uh, um, If in, in a Winter's Night a Traveller? Um, is that space that you are channeling your words and your images and your metaphors in, is it something very private and intimate, or is it public already in your mind at the time of, of writing? Yeah, I, I, my ideal would be to write without uh, an imaginary reader. That's what I aim for, I would say. But at this moment, it's not like that. I always have either myself as a reader, I need to, because I know how the language functions. I know, well, I, kn I have my own criteria. I know what I like, what I don't. I know I have my, f my own favorite poems. But also, sometimes when I struggle with the poem, sometimes it's easy, sometimes the poem just goes out and it, that's all, or, or I already have it done in my head before I uh, write it down. But sometimes when I struggle, it's a bit of schizophrenia with a lot of voices in my head uh, telling me from different perspectives um, why something is good and something is bad. So I do struggle when I write and um, I do, um, I am, uh, I'm doing a, a auto sensor, self, self -censorship. censorship. Yeah, self censorship. I'm doing that, and I'm when I'm doing that, I'm trying to to stop writing and to leave the the process um, to to leave for some other day or or I don't know later during the day or whatever. So yes, I do have uh, imaginary reader, and I do. Uh, I do have expectations. I would lie if I would say that I don't. And uh, Lilia, when you write, are you thinking already of uh, performance while you're writing? Or is it more of an internal monologue and then you think about performance after? En fait, moi, j'ai commencé l'écriture à l'âge de 10 ans. Et donc, À l'âge de 10 ans, j'étais encore à l'école et je suis en train de comprendre la langue en elle-même. Et donc, euh, euh, grandir avec la langue et l'écriture en même temps, je crois que l'écriture, c'est devenu la continuité de mes doigts. C'est un outil, c'est très proche de moi, c'est inconscient, c'est moi. Et donc, euh, maintenant, avec le recul et quand je n'écris je je, plus, comme ça pour moi-même, quand, quand je veux et comment je veux, mais plutôt je suis engagée sur d'autres projets, avec d'autres personnes, dans, dans des conditions précises, j'essaie, je, je, je me, premièrement, je me rends compte de cette relation avec l'écriture, et deuxièmement, j'essaie de faire le recul pour me trouver le premier, peut-être, lecteur de moi-même. Parce qu'avant, parce qu je... Non, j'écris tout simplement. Tout ce qui est à l'intérieur, je l'écris et tu peux me lire à travers mon écriture. Mais là, je suis en train d'apprendre même comment sortir de moi-même et faire le recul et regarder ce que j'écris. Parce que peut-être toutes les personnes qui ont déjà assisté, ils sont des, les meilleurs lecteurs de, de ce que j'écris plus que moi-même. Donc euh, moi, je suis maintenant en train d'apprendre... De, de comment maîtriser ce que j'écris, comment de, de le regarder, de le lire même. So Lilia saying, I started writing when I was 10 years old, so obviously I was still at school and I was still trying to understand language. 
And she says, I was growing up with the language. And um, so she says, there was the language and there was writing, and writing became a kind of extension, like it flowed through her body, through her fingers, and that's it. And so um, she said, but when I'm working uh, in a particular context uh, with other people, um, that's when I start reflecting about my relationship with writing. And she says, um, that's where I need to kind of distance myself um, so that I become the first reader, the first person who is actually reading myself. And so she says, that's completely different to what I wrote um, when I was younger, that when if someone had to read her earlier texts, then they would actually see her in her texts. Um, whereas nowadays she believes that probably uh, other people are better readers of herself than herself. Um, Zoe, as we will hear a little bit later, you write a lot about space, spaces, rooms, buildings, cities, and also uh, poems with a lot of walking, I believe, like walking in a city or walking along a river. So at the time of writing, do you have some kind of ideal reader in mind, like someone who is walking or a reader who walks a lot or a reader who wants to walk? Um, well, I, I think um, I'm, I'm aware of trying to um, make a space in which to move around in a poem. And I assume that you know, if it's this kind of space that I want to move around in, then I'm not so unusual that there won't be somebody else who would also find that interesting. So I, I kind of assume I'm nothing out of the ordinary if I'm, if I'm writing you know, for, for somebody like me. Um, so I think that idea of sort of projecting, you know, a reader who's different from yourself, I mean, it, it, it assumes some kind of self-importance, I don't think is very helpful. So, but that idea of sort of the, the text as a space is um, really important for me. And I would go along with um, what we've heard already from both sides, Joko's idea of a sort of almost schizophrenic um, sense of a, a different voices sort of coming from different directions. That's a kind of space, isn't it? And I, and I think it's not schizophrenic. I think that's how our minds work. And, um, and I think we, you know, we do uh, live in a, a mental process that's just full of language. And you know, it comes from outside. It's things that we remember. And Lilia's um, idea of language sort of flowing through her I think is also a very, you know, very lovely way of thinking about that. And you know, both of, both of those also they give you that sense of, you know, um, a, a sort of a multiple space made out of language. And and I suppose yes, that's what I that's what I think about when I'm when I'm writing a, 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 a space a language space I want to live in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's listen to some poetry now. Um, at this year's uh, Venice Biennale, um, the Tunisian pavilion featured an installation which was called The Absence of Paths, focusing on questions of nation-state borders, freedom of movement, and uh, one of these kiosks was issuing what they called a frisa, like a visa, but using the word free, frisa. These were little blue booklets used to migrate from one kiosk to the next, and also uh, to enter um, some of the events taking place at the Tunisian Pavilion. One of these events was a performance by uh, Lydia um, of a poem written in Tunisian Arabic, um, performed in the street between the kiosk and the canal. You were wearing a very large red cloak, um, and a lot of the passers-by stopped to listen. Um, so I, I invite you to perform this poem, and uh, after that, um, Roger West uh, will be reading 
an English version um, that he made through the French uh, as part of this translation workshop. تصور كان أنا مت تو تصور كان أنا مت وخرجت وغمضت عيني وحليتهم ما نعرفش كان حليتهم ولا المهم مت نلقى برشا فراشات دايرين بيا يدغدغوا فيا فما زاد شمس قويه جهرتني هي كالشمس ولا كعبة القارس ما نعرفش انا في وسطها ولا قدامها المهم جهرتني إشعاع متاحة يتعدى مني معنى هنا كل كسكاس ولا المرأة أنا هكا وتصب الماء عليا تبلني وما تبلنيش تجيني وما تمسنيش ومن بعد بديت نكبر ونطلع في الشجر من راسي وساقية وبدني الكل ورد وحشيش وشجر محليه الإحساس كي تبدأ تنبت والفراشات الدغدغ فيا والشمس تجهر فيا أنا نحب أنا أنا نحب أنا نحب أنا نحب كان جيت شجرة كبيرة تظلل في الشتابور دقينا في الربيع توتة في الخريف نخلة وفي الصيف خوخة أنا كي نموت شجرة تو تصور كان أنا فقت وخرج طول الشارع الشمس ما زالت متخبية والنسمة داير على قطرات نداف وقشجر اتطيح فيهم بالقطرة بالقطرة سكني البرد وسقية لحفاية منهم للزفت درت في الشوارع وعيني لبست البنيات برشا حيوت برشا حيوت ورا كل باب برشا كلام وترت ورا تحكي على خطاوينا على هموم اللي هازتها ساقينا عطار مقابل ززار بجنب خضار مقابل التقهو على يمينك حلاق فوقهم سماء فوقهم سماء شمس تزرق وبرشا نوى والقدام القدام آخر الشارع في العينين ما يوفاش العينين تلمع العينين تدمع السقين واحدها تقدم وريح الدز وشمس تبعد بش ما تجهرش وآخر الشارع ما فهمت شيء ما لقيت شيء ندمت اللي جريت والهذت وما لقيت وقعت على ركاي بنسرق في نفس وقعت نسمعش شوية حس وقمت وقمت من كل شيء رمشيت وجريت وقدمت وخرت وضحكت وتسككت وفديت وبكيت ونسيت نسيت بش نغزر روحي من داخل نسيت بش نغزر روحي من داخل ونرى في قلبي شجرة كبرت ونرى فوقها عصفور بنجار ويكتب ويصور عش ونرى الشجرة الطايح سكرها الريح وكل عصفور بك السويت يقول ويزيد ونرى التحال والمصار والعصاب والعظام الكل الكل بدني كل قاعد ينبت ونرى فيها خضرة ونرى فيها نرى فيها خضرة ومنورة وكل مرة تحكى عبغلة وناكلها وقلبها نلوح في وسط الشارع وينبت شجرة وحليت عيني نلقى روحي من داخل البرة ونلقى روحي جنة في الجنة ونلقى كل حد من العطار للززار للزبال للخضار الكل كلهم جنين ومن وقتها ولينا نسلف في بعضنا في الخضرة والغلة وساعات نعدي وعشويات في رواحنا وكي تصب المطر نتخباو في رواحنا هك الشارع وساعة هك الشجرة دار العصفور هك الحلمة ما زالت والمحبة 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 سكنة التراكن ونبتة جناين وجناين Imagine now that I'm dead that I've closed my eyes and then opened them again. Whether I did open them again, I don't know. The important thing is, I'm dead. I'm surrounded by butterflies that flutter against my skin, and there's this bright sun dazzling me. Whether it's a sun or a lemon, I don't know. I'm at the same time inside and outside it. The important thing is, it dazzles me. Its rays streak across me like a sieve or a mirror, perhaps. Water splashes me. It soaks me, yet doesn't soak me. It touches me, yet doesn't touch me. Then my whole body begins to stretch upwards. I'm covered with roses and grass and trees, and it's a beautiful feeling when I start to take root. As butterflies flutter against my skin, and the sun dazzles me. Oh, to be a large, shady tree. An orange tree in winter, a peach tree in summer a mulberry tree in spring, a palm tree in autumn. Oh yes, when I die, I will be a tree. Imagine now that I've woken up and gone out into the street. The sun is still hidden 
and the wind shakes the dewdrops from the trees. The cold settles on me, concrete beneath my bare feet. Out in these streets, the buildings crowd in on me, behind their walls, behind each door, so many words. The pavements tell of our passing. Over there, a grocer and a butcher. Next door, a baker, then a greengrocer. Across the street, a cafe, and next to that, a hairdresser. And up above, the sky, the shining sun, and so many flowers. I walk on. The street stretches on and on, and I go on, my eyes glistening with tears. I go on on legs that seem to have nothing to do with me. The wind blows and the sun shies away, the walls melt, and the street widens before my eyes. The more I walk, the wider it gets. I quicken my pace, my heart beats faster. I'm sweating, but the breeze cools me. And finally, there, at the end of the street, I understand nothing, nothing. I'm sorry I hurried all the way there out of breath just to find nothing. I crouch down and hold my breath, listening for the slightest sound. I stay like that for a while, hoping to see something. Then I stand up and walk around, backwards, forwards, frightened, brave again, laughing, shouting, crying, shaking, choking, forgetting, forgetting to close my eyes and look at myself. I see a tree growing in my heart, and on it I see a bird with a nest in its beak. And I see the tree sway as if drunk with the wind, and the bird swaying with it as his song tells us everything. And I see my kidneys and all my organs and my nerves and my bones. My whole body is taking root. I am lush. I am luxuriant. Whenever a fruit falls, I eat it and throw the seed into the street, and it immediately becomes another tree. And now I open my eyes to see myself outside of it all. To see myself a garden paradise and to see that everyone, the greengrocer, the butcher, the dustman and the hairdresser, has also become a garden. We're starting to enjoy this, exchanging fruit, vegetables, roses, spending days together, and when it rains, taking shelter within ourselves. The street has widened. Our lives are verdant. Our hearts have grown. This tree of mine is a haven for birds. The dream continues. Love lives in these places. It has flowered in a thousand gardens. Merci <laughs> Um, thank you, Roger. Roger's translation is based on the French version of the poem by Hajer Boudin. Um, Lydia, I have w one question. I had four, but I will ask one because time is flying. Okay, one question about uh, this poem. So it's very lyrical, it's allegorical. You don't mention borders directly, and um, you speak of a wish to transform in this poem into a tree or many trees, um, taking root, offering shade, welcoming butterflies, and at the same time, the poem expresses a desire to walk in all directions. So my question is, um, did you write this poem specifically for uh, the absence of paths? En effet, je n'ai pas écrit ce texte spécialement pour la Biennale de Venise, mais si on veut aussi interpréter ce texte, il porte indirectement sur la thématique de, de vouloir euh, partir ou se retrouver ou faire le voyage, même le, vo le voyage dans, dans l'émotion peut-être, dans la pensée ou dans le temps, même pas l'espace. Et donc, euh, moi, je trouve que, que ce texte, il, euh, je l'ai écrit parce que j'ai voulu en fait ouvrir un autre espace et une autre possibilité où je peux choisir ce que je voulais être, où qu'est-ce que je veux faire, où, où aller et comment être et comment l'espace, et je le construis, je construis l'espace comme je veux. Et donc c'est pour ça que je vois que, que pour 
ce, 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 ce poème, il est un, un voyage en lui-même, peut-être clandestin et contre les lois de la nature aussi, comme, comme ils font les migrants clandestins, les, les, le voyage clandestin. Et euh, c'est pour ça que je me permets de dire que je veux être un arbre, je suis un arbre, euh, que le, les rayons du, du soleil me transpercent, que la pluie peut venir mais ne pas me toucher, qu'à que, qu l'intérieur, j'ai je, je un arbre. Et donc, euh, j'ai vraiment construit un, un autre monde imaginaire où je me sens plus à l'aise, où je, vraiment, c'est moi. Je, ça, ça, devient, ça revient toujours l'idée que le désir d'être un arbre dans plusieurs autres textes et... Euh, et réellement, je ne sais pas pourquoi, je n'ai pas une réponse bien, une réponse claire sur, sur ce sujet, mais, mais finalement, je crois que la structure même de l'arbre, elle, elle euh, m'intéresse beaucoup, le fait d'avoir des racines, d'être enraciné dans, dans, ton, dans une identité que tu choisis, ce n'est pas, pas celle qu'on t'a donnée, ma propre identité à moi que j'ai choisi, que j'ai construit, et avoir un tronc, une structure ben, forte, et avoir des branches qui sont dans le ciel, qui sont partout, qui peuvent, euh, qui peuvent toucher le ciel, et partout, et être aussi euh, la maison des, des, des oiseaux. <rire> donc, euh, donc cette structure me, me favorise le fait d'aller partout, d'aller dans toutes les directions, d'être soi-même partout, de, de, de se chercher et de se trouver ou non, ou pas, peut-être. Mais, mais justement, je, je veux adopter cette structure pour, pour aller où je veux et, euh, et partout. Ok, juste, uh, Lilia said... Um I didn't write this text explicitly for the Biennale. Um, she said, what this poem is trying to express is the wish to leave, uh, the wish to um, go on a journey. Um, it could be a journey um, a journey in, in one's thoughts or in one's feelings or even in time. Um, but it's what it's trying to do is creating a different space, but a space where she can choose where to go, who to be. Um, so she's creating the space that she wants. Um, it may be a clandestine a journey Uh, she says it may also be a journey that goes against uh, the laws of nature. It says in that, in that sense, it could be um, similar to the journey that migrants um, make. Um, she also said that's why she, she is she likes the image of the tree so much. She says, and that's also why she talks about the rays of the sun and the, 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 the rain uh, soaking her and not soaking her at the same time. She says, this image of the tree is something that um, is a recurrent image in her poetry, it's not just in this text. And she's particularly attached to it. Um, when you think about a tree, there's this structure. On the one hand, you've got roots, and the roots dig deep into the ground, and then there's the trunk, which is um, a symbol of strength. But then you've got branches, and the branches are like, um, reaching out to the sky and um, well that's also where um, you would find birds and she says for me this this idea this image is like
being deeply rooted into an identity that one has chosen. Not that one has been given or inherited, but really one that has been chosen. Um, and being able to go everywhere from there um, in any direction that one chooses. Uh, and maybe one will find oneself, or maybe not. Thank you, Nadia, for the very detailed and precise translation of, of Lilia's words. Um, Gyoko, I would like to ask you to recite one poem. We had planned three, but all this talk about space and time has flown. Um, could you read uh, the poem called Home? In, in the original Macedonian, and then uh, Kate Rex will read a version in English. Dom. Dom. Mol kod vutrovata se uči. Nikola Mađirov. Pravi me kukička od stolčeto prefrlajki debelo kebe preku nego. Sustava me svet samo za sebe. Во кој ништо друго не постои, само тишината на нашето дишење. Home. We arrange a thick blanket over a chair and make a house, creating a world just for us. Inside there is nothing but the quiet of our breathing. I'd like to ask you one question about this poem. So this poem, Home, and another poem you have called Homeless, remind me of uh, the last four lines of a well-known poem also entitled Home by Nikola Machirov, who you quote at the beginning of the poem. Um, so Nikola's uh, poem ends like this, in one of the many English versions that exist. From birth, I've from birth, I've migrated to quiet places, and voids have clung beneath me like snow that doesn't know if it belongs to the earth or to the air. So th there is this image of snow, which might belong to the earth or to the air or something in between. So this feeling of home as something fluid, impermanent, undefined, intangible, maybe even unattainable, is present in your poems as well. Um, do you think it's possible for a, a poet to fill this void by building a home or a private space out of words? I don't know if I will answer exactly the, the question because it was a long one. So I will uh, try to... Can, can you build a home out of words? Yeah, but I have to say something about uh, Nicola. Yeah. Yeah. When, I, w when I wrote my book, uh, House of Migratory Birds, I was under a great influence of... Um, Nicholas' book, Relocated Stone, that was 2009 when I found out the, the book. So, um, I, uh, when, when I speak about home, I mainly write or speak about body as a home as body, as a first and last home. And in between, we have different homes and we are migrating and we can make a home out of words. But when I speak about home, I'm speaking about body as a first and last. And um, what, I've, what I realized and what I believe in is 
when I realized that I was, and that was when I first met death, when I first touched a dead body, I realized that we are not bodies, but that we live in a body, and that we are migratory birds that which changes bodies. So what I believe is that our body is mortal, but our consciousness is immortal, and we are just migratory birds changing homes. And we do that during, in one body, but we also change the bodies as homes. That would be what is about in all of these uh, poems. Nicholas, I mean, Nicholas' influence on my poetry and home and homeless and uh, the other one, uh, body remembers everything, yeah. What you just said is going to link very closely, I think, to my question that I will put to Zoe. But I'm going to ask you first to read um, a poem from, from your collection, Remains of a Future City, which came out in 2008. Remains of a Future City. You're, you're, you're playing with space and time at once. Um, I'm, go I'm going to let you choose. Maybe building site? Or, yeah? <laughs> Building site. Between the buildings, trees reach down to languages of soil and worms. Leaves gloss argos of glass and steel. Woods lie down on floors to bounce back every word, every word you speak with the long echo of your footsteps down into the mud. In simultaneous decay and growth, this maze of streets and squares puts down its roots unsettling the ground with every new inflection, every demolition. First the trees, then the wooden houses, bricks, the broken concrete. Look, now you can see in the ruins how buildings took hold and pushed up through your bones, rubble, walls of earth, this tangle of useless pipes. It's great to hear the, the rhythm of that poem. I had listened to it already on Lyric Line, but it's even better live because of the, the physical vibrations of the air. I'm saying that because um, I believe poetry to be something which is very physical. Um, it's, it's made of air, it's made of saliva. It's, poetry is a product of the body, not only of uh, intellectual games or words. Um, so, in this poem that you've just read, Building Site, you speak of languages of soil and worms. Uh, woods lie down on floors to bounce back every word that you speak. In, an other, in another poem, you speak of uh, your voice at breaking point rolls over a mouthful of bricks. Very uh, tough, very physical image. So. Um, Language in these poems feels very material, very tangible, consistent, and at times even heavy, the mouthful of bricks. What led you to explore and to cultivate this, this physicality, this corporeity of language? Something that will be familiar to people here, which is living in a bilingual country. And um, so where I live in North Wales, um, it's about 50% of people are, are Welsh speaking and um, and sometimes language is quite tangible you can feel the way that people move into in and out of language spaces and um, and that they structure people's lives and interactions and it's a complexity that I really enjoy about where I live but sometimes it's also painful and difficult and it it, it certainly does make you aware of, um, of living in language, which you, you are not if you live you know, somewhere where 
there, there is just a, a single language, I think it becomes perhaps transparent. You don't think about it so much. And, um, and so in this um, um, book that you mentioned, you know, published uh, nearly 10 years ago, um, I, was, I was really coming to grips with um, what it meant for me to be writing in English, but alongside this other language, Welsh, which um, I've been trying to learn painfully for many years, but speak very, very badly. And, um, but, but, I, but I do value the fact that it's, that it's there. Um, so I think that's the, the background to it. And then um, also, you know, you talked about this, the, the, um, the trees reach down to languages of soil and worms. Well, I suppose we, we don't know what the languages of, of soil and worms are because they, the, the, there's something going on, but we really don't know um, what it is. And that's something that... Um, I think I'm interested in exploring in a poem the sort of limits of, of knowledge. And um, there is also a quote from Wittgenstein in there. Um, so the, this idea of the maze and streets and of maze of streets and squares, you know, that's just um, stolen, actually, from, from Wittgenstein. But I think if, if you think about language as being like a city or um, something that is built, constructed, knocked down, built again, it becomes um, malleable. What you have is not a given. That opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, and, um, and the sense of, the, like Lilia was saying, you know, an identity that's mobile and in process and, um, and changing that you, you, you have to make um, for yourself in some ways, but in, in a social um, situation because a city is social and and language is, is, is social, and you know, translation too. So when we hear these poems talking through different languages, um, you know, we're also getting that sense of um, you know, what, the, what the poem does in a space. And I think um, I'm interested in inhabiting that um, sense of language from the beginning of, of the poem. I had more questions specific to your poems, but I'm going to skip them because uh, time uh, has, is, is running out. But I would like to open the floor if there are any questions from, uh, from the audience to any or all of our three authors. Ah, this one. I think there's a question here. Do, how many of you speak a second language? Obviously, you do, uh, you kind of speak Welsh, right? And, and French as well. Um, how different does it feel in terms of identity, speaking and writing you know, as poets in your second language compared to your native? Does it feel very different? Do you feel like you're talking as a different person? That's my question. Did you write Welsh? I, I, oh. Sorry, I write. Uh, yes, I, I, I only write in English. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I translate from French, but I, I would only write a poem in English. But I'm just interested in the fact that English exists alongside other languages. I think that's what I was talking about there. Oscar in standard Arabic yeah. and uh, for the past five years has been uh, writing and performing in Tunisian. So would you like to say something about this? Oui, j'ai commencé à écrire en arabe littéraire lorsque j'avais 10 ans jusqu'à 2012 lorsque j'avais 24 ans et donc j'ai passé vraiment 14 ans en écrire en arabe littéraire mais après, j'ai passé par une expérience où j'avais besoin de, de un peu se libérer de, de l'arabe littéraire comme une forme un peu stricte, où il y a des règles, comment écrire et tout, pour passer euh, au dialecte tunisien, qui est, qui est, qui est la langue de, le dialecte de tous les jours, où 
il y a un autre défi, comment élaborer d'autres, euh, des, des images poétiques et, et à travers euh, en fait, les poèmes en dialecte tunisien, tu peux faire plusieurs lectures des textes, ils sont plus accessibles aux citoyens puisque je fais la performance dans l'espace public et euh, donc ça, tu, tu acquiers une dimension aussi sociale et dans la communication avec l'autre qui, 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 qui partage avec toi l'espace le, le, et donc ça, ça, peut, ça peut parler à tout le monde, à monsieur tout le monde qui, qui est là et euh, ça, ça a ouvert vraiment d'autres dimensions même au niveau des, des images poétiques et des... Euh, euh, et le fait de développer un autre langage aussi, de parler image avec la langue du quotidien. Ok, so Lilia was saying, um, I've been writing since I was 10, and I was using uh, classical Arabic. Um, and then in 2012, when she was 24, uh, she started writing in the Tunisian dialect. And she said she did that because for her, it gave her a sense of freedom. Um, in, in classic Arabic, uh, you've got very strict rules. Um, you need to um, keep to a certain form. Uh, whereas the Tunisian dialect is the language that is used every single day. And it it allows for different images. So she says the Tunisian dialect is also allows for a multi-layered text. It's also accessible, more accessible. So anybody can understand um, her text. And so she's interested in um, developing or creating that kind of communication. Um, And by doing so, it takes on a social dimension. So her writing in the Tunisian dialect takes on this social dimension. And she's interested also in creating uh, metaphors, this poetic language, out of um, the language that one would use for you know, everyday tasks. Are there any other questions? There's a question back there. Does, uh, hi. Does the space you think of and write your poem shape the poem you create? So um, does, does the space you're in whilst you're thinking of the poem and then writing it actually change the, the poem you actually end up making? I, I don't understand really the question. You mean the form of the poem? Like if the poem looks... Um, the, po the form, the topic, the rhythm... You know, if, if you were to write a space here or in an open area or, um, you know, in a tower block, whatever, on a plane. Uh, okay, I, th I think, yeah, so, th so the actual, where the writing happens. It, yes, I, well, I, um, it's something that I have experimented with and um, I like writing outside and in fact some of the collection that I've just read from um, I, I sort of wrote while walking or I gave myself um, particular rules to follow while walking for example like um, going into the countryside with a map of the city and trying to follow the map of um, Cardiff, which is the capital city of Wales, but follow that on a mountain or follow um, a street map of Brussels in a wood. And um, just, yeah, for, for thinking about, you know, because we, we tend to, when we go into, uh, or 
so it's wild, wild spaces or so-called nature. You know, we, we, we perhaps take a set of expectations, but actually rural spaces are also very constructed. So I wanted to think about, well, how, how are also rur rural spaces um, constructed and social, and how do I bring that thinking about cities and language to bear on natural environments? But but also that process of being somewhere and writing. Yes, I think it does, it does change how you write. And um, the other thing is that you, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't see while I was reading, but actually the, the shape of these poems on the page is very much a, a kind of wandering around the page with a lot of white space and lines in strange places. So, so I'm trying to make a connection between the space of the page and the the space of the walk, and, and making a language space to move around in. Thank you, it's an interesting question. They might yes. not be very visible from, no, from where you, you are. Just imagine but, lines all over the place. <laughs> but if you, but um, there's a link on the uh, Facebook event page. There's a link to some of uh, Zoe's poems on a website called Lyric Line, and there you can see the actual physical um, disposition of the text as it is spaced out. And, and I think reading might also be a wandering around. You know, so if, if it's spaced out, you could read in different ways too. Sorry. Justement, la question d'espace sort toujours quand on parle de, de performance et du texte dans, dans l'espace. Et donc, la question, j'ai passé par plusieurs euh, expériences où le texte, il naît de l'espace ou bien il, est, euh, il, il le modifie si, si on veut, ou on essaye de... de, de de laisser un, un impact sur cet espace. Et donc, euh, par exemple, j'ai eu une, une euh, j'ai fait un projet, une performance avec une artiste où on a pendant quatre heures, on répétait le, le même, elle, elle répétait le même geste. Moi, je répète le même texte. Et il y a une vidéo qui, euh, donc, la lumière dans l'espace où, où on se trouvait dans l'espace public. Et donc euh, L'idée d'habiter cet espace ou bien de construire un autre dans cet espace avec des choses qui réellement n'existent pas comme la parole, la lumière et le geste a, a vraiment donné une autre euh, identité à l'espace. Et le fait de répéter le, les, trois, les trois composantes de cette performance en fait, on a acquiert une autre dimension. C'est comme une ascension, c'est comme une prière ou un rituel où tu, où tu le fais. Par contre, dans un espace, dans, dans l'espace public, dans la rue, dans le quotidien des gens qui passent de part et d'autre, dans les gens qui, partagent, qui, qui passent par cette rue pour rentrer chez eux. Et donc là, on, on sent le, le pouvoir de la parole associé aussi à d'autres formes artistiques pour changer, même construire ou démolir ou donner une autre dimension à l'espace. C'est vraiment, c'était temporaire, c'est vrai, c'est ponctuel aussi, mais, mais ça provoque comme une, comme une fente dans l'espace public. Et, et aussi, c est, c est, ces performances dans l'espace, avec la parole aussi, construisent, construisent des des espaces. En fait, le fait de faire une performance avec un texte, tu construis un espace ponctuel qui aussi apparaît et disparaît dans d'autres espaces. Et donc, tu crées une sorte de dynamique dans la ville avec le fait de, de réciter un texte et donc de, de provoquer une sorte d'espace spatio-temporaire aussi. Temporaire aussi. So, yes, she said that uh, it's an essential question when you're talking about 
performance and space because obviously they, they go together and um, uh, she said that um, she has tried uh, different things where in different projects where the text like the, where space gives birth to the text or the other way around where the text kind of modifies, changes uh, the space. Um, so there is an, an impact uh, of, the, of the text on the space where the text is being delivered. Um, so uh, Lilia talked about a, a performance uh, that she did together with another artist. And this performance was a four hour performance. And um, the other person was repeating the same gesture, so for four hours. And Lilia was saying the same text over and over again for four hours in a public space. And there was also um, some kind of light show or video. I, I, so, and she said, um, by repeating the same gesture, by repeating the same text over and over again, um, the space where we were uh, took on a different meaning. She says it became a kind of prayer-like, ritual-like um, um, space. It took on a, a prayer-like dimension. And added to that, you have to think that this is um, a space where people are continually uh, passing by, they're living their lives, and, you know, so the energy of all that gives to the text a different dimension. And you realize how powerful um, words can be, but also how powerful other forms of art can be. So she said, um, you can give meaning to space, you can take meaning um, um, out of space. It means you can, you can, you can, you can steal uh, the meaning that a place originally has somehow or change it or modify it. And she says it's like um, opening a crack in public space. She uses this word, which is a crack, une fissure. Um, and she also said that performance gives you um, the chance to have these instances, like temporary spaces that are moving from one place to another. That's what performance does. It gives you instances. Are there any more questions? Oh, there are two. Uh, you first and then, and then maybe, yes. <laughs> so, hi. Um, listening to you guys and uh, talking about space, I want to ask a question regarding what you've said and creativity. Um, it could be argued that poetic forms could be seen as traditional open spaces, sorry, traditional closed spaces, but accessible to the public, like sonnets, villanelles, and so on. How do you uh, approach this when you write? Um, do you constrict yourself to the form? Do you put the personal into the public? What would be your process when you're um, putting something into a fixed um, rhyme pattern, verse form, etc.? Thank you. Uh, I, I never have uh, the form that I would like to write when I write. If it comes out, if the rhyme comes out, that's great. If not, then nothing. Uh, what I care most is the rhythm, because I also... Um, when I write and when I'm finishing the poem, I'm rereading it all over again and again and again until I get if, it's, if the rhythm is right or not, and I'm making breaks inside of the verses, and I like 
uh, crushing verses, and I like putting um, spots in the middle where they're not expected. And I like doing jazzy rhythm. Uh, I, I like doing that, yeah, I like playing with the rhythm and with the uh, pause, with the break in the poem. But I, I have never r wrote a, a sonnet, for example. I have never been there. I, maybe I should do that sometimes, sometime. Um, I, I do sometimes use um, traditional um, forms, but I tend to use them as a very deliberate kind of constraint because, I mean, actually, the, I mean, the word stanza, I mean, it is a, a room. And um, the, uh, with, with the sonnet, I think, also, there's an idea of sort of going into this sort of boxy space. And so... Um, I think sometimes that's interesting to do, but it's also interesting to look at what that structure is made of, test the edges and bash it around a bit and um, uh, yeah, be aware that it is a, a, a kind of, yeah, perhaps an interesting constraint. Um, but in the, the poem that I read to you earlier in this book that I was talking about, most of that book is um, deliberately you know, trying to do something quite different um, with form, which is to um, think about very, very open um, spaces. And I suppose it's that, that's also linked to a, an experimental um, tradition, if that's... I don't think that's an oxymoron, actually. I think there, there are kind of strains of experiment that come through. But in um, British and American poetry, which is to do with an idea of open form and... Um, uh, and this idea that if you are um, breaking up the space of the page, you also offer to the reader a different um, set of possibilities to move around in. Um, and so you make that space of the page um, a space in which the, the, the reader can also go in and, and perhaps perform different kinds of of readings, you know, there would be choices about how to navigate that space, how to read um, the poem. And so it, it is trying to, to open up th that space um, because, um, yeah, I, I think behind your question, there was a, a sense of maybe these, these forms being sort of closed and forbidding. And, um, and I, I think um, that's a very interesting uh, area to, uh, to explore as a, as a writer. Yeah, thanks for the question. No, I, it's, this is just a, a short comment to thank you for a truly memorable session. I absolutely loved it. Maybe because I'm very close to the fan, but <laughs> 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 I think it's, it, it was an uh, absolutely wonderful uh, space you've shared with us. I absolutely loved what you said and the way you said it and the way you listened to each other and responded to each other. And that goes from all, Nadia, all the way from Nadia to, to Antoine. Um, and I was reflecting on why I enjoyed it so much. Um, and I think there would be, of course, the first reason is what you were talking about and the way you, you dealt with the complexities of your own personal experience and also the experience of other people who write poetry and other forms of poetry. I think there was another reason, um, apart from the sensitivities that, you, that we're, we've, been, uh, we've been robbed of uh, in, in the way language and discourse is used in, in the media today and sometimes even in the social media. I think there was another reason. I think what was very special was, uh, what, was what happened when you presented your poetry, when you performed your poetry in, in the three different ways and the three different rhythms that you presented. Um, and I think that's when, in, 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 in my own you know, personal experience, that's when you really... Uh, uh, inhabited completely the space, the space we're in. And to me, it happened mainly because of the rhythm and the magic of, the magic of poetry generally, but especially, I think, because of the rhythm. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Adrian. Um, so uh, just as we're wrapping up, um, right now in the workshops below us, there's an exhibition uh, happening um, of works by two authors who were here in residence in the Malta School of Art. You're invited to go down the stairs uh, where the yellow door is um, to, to see those artworks. It's cooler downstairs than here, I promise. Um, the next pre-festival event, tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. in, uh, in Maori, uh, we'll have um, an open mic uh, where everyone is invited to come and read uh, or sing or perform. And then the festival itself begins on Thursday at 8 o'clock in uh, St. Elmo. Also on Friday and Saturday, 8 o'clock, the full program is uh, on the internet, on the the Initiamed uh, website or Facebook page. Um, big thank you to Nadia for coming in at the last minute to translate so precisely. And, and um, thank you very much, Nadia, for you have a, a capacity of concentration which is amazing, really, really. <laughs> Thank you to Kate Rex and to Roger West for their translations and for reading their translations out as well. They will, they will be special guests tomorrow at the Open Mic at Maori. And thank you especially to Lydia, to Zoe and to Gyoko for their time, for their company, for their ideas uh, about the private and the public and everything in between. Uh, we look forward to hearing you again during the festival. Thank you for, for, for coming to listen and see you again in the next few days.